For those that are visiting, we're in our study of the book of Luke. And today, we're in chapter 3. The title of our lesson is, The Voice of God. We read in chapter 3, these introductory words this chapter. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, Herod Tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip Tetrarch of Eutria and Traconius, and Licinius Tetrarch of Abilene, during the priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the desert. Let's just stop right there. Right here, Luke uses a very traditional way to date this particular time. Even in the Romans at that particular time, they had different dates that they would attach to things. And even to this day, we would say that uh, uh, our date is 2008, but the Chinese would say this is the year 4075 or something to that effect. So right here, by introducing all the political figures of that day, everybody can be sure of this particular moment. We remember, of course, that Luke is the gospel that's written to the Gentiles, that the message is not just for the Jews about the Messiah, but for the whole world, the Gentiles too. And so right here at the very beginning, he names the most powerful person on earth, Tiberius Caesar. He, of course, is the stepson of Augustus Caesar. And then he says, and Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea. Actually, the word there is prefect. And uh, very interestingly, the Roman Empire was broken down into uh, different provinces. Some were imperial provinces that the emperor controlled, and some were senatorial provinces that the Senate controlled. But no matter which one, there were individuals that were appointed to be in charge of these provinces. So, if you were a military guy and they needed an army to si kind of subdue that province, you were called a legate. If you were, so to speak, a, a politician, then you're called a prefect, or in some translations you'll find procreator. And of course, this particular person was in charge of the whole province itself, taking care of the taxes and, of course, having peace in that land. Earlier on in Luke 1, we talked about Herod the Great, and his reign was from 37 B.C. to 4 B.C., now, Herod the Great died in 4 B.C., and his, so to speak, province was broken up three ways to his three sons. Now, the old province that he had is what you and I would kind of call the ancient Israel. It include Israel and Judea. But he had three sons. One is Archelaus. He took care of Judea and Samaria. Another was Herod Antipas. He got Galilee. And then their half-brother, Philip, took care of the, kind of the northern part of the Transjordan area. Very interestingly, Archelaus is banished from leadership because of some things that he did. And over time, Pontius Pilate becomes the procreator, or as this particular translation says, the governor of Judea. And so we have, so to speak, the secular leadership lined on up. But of course, right here, Luke also wants to pull in and say, okay, these were also the spiritual leaders. And he says very interestingly right here, he says, during the high priesthood of Annas, and Caiaphas. Now, very interestingly, there was always only one high priest. Annas actually was the high priest from about 6 to 15 AD. There were, of course, a few other short terms of high priests, but then at this particular time, Caiaphas is actually the high priest. Now, in the Greek right here, high priest is singular. So Caiaphas is the singular high priest, but Annas is still living and you see, Annas is Caiaphas' father-in-law. And so, so to speak, there's an influence beyond the actual person of power, kind of maybe, maybe a little bit like George Bush with George Bush Sr. right there. And so right here, this is the political setting that this notes. And so we know because of all of these factors that the year in our terminology is 29 A.D., and the Bible says in 29 A.D., the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the desert. And remember, we left him right when he was born. And then there was a little notation. After a while, he went to the desert. And there he began his ministry. 
Of course, his parents were quite old, and so they probably died when he was a young man. And he goes into the desert, and there he spends time with God and prepares for his great ministry. Now, the title of our first point is simply this, Silence Shattered. Verse 3. He went into all the country around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, a voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. Every valley shall be filled in, every mountain and hill made low, the crooked roads shall become straight, the rough ways smooth, and all mankind will see God's salvation. Well, right here, we begin to get a glimpse of the scope of John the Baptist's ministry. And if we look on over to Matthew chapter 3, it's even more detailed. Go on over there if you would, please. Remember, Luke is written to a Gentile audience. Matthew is written to a Jewish audience. And in chapter 3, we read the account of Matthew about John the Baptist's ministry. It's a little bit more detailed. In verse 1, In those days John the Baptist came preaching in the desert to Judea, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. This is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah. A voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. John's clothes were made of camel hair, and he had leather belt around his waist. His food was locust and wild honey. People went out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region of the Jordan, confessing their sins. They were baptized by him in the Jordan River. So right here we see the scope is not only are people in that area around the Jordan coming to John, but it says that scores of people are coming from Jerusalem. As a matter of fact, all Judea. As a matter of fact, all the way up the Jordan River. And of course, this eventually is the first place that Peter and Andrew and John first meet Jesus. So this revival inside of Israel was something unparalleled, something that hadn't been seen ever before. And you know, it is quite interesting right here about the notational differences of the Isaiah passage. Matthew uses Isaiah 40, verse 3. But notice that Luke uses Isaiah 40, 3 through 5. Why? What's verse 5 say? And all mankind will see God's salvation. Luke wanted it clear, is that salvation was for both Jew and Gentile. He wanted to, everybody to know that Jesus Christ had come to save the whole world. Are you with me here, church? You know, it is interesting from a scriptural point of view, there is an incredible silence. There's an incredible desert between the last oracle of God, the book of Malachi, and this, the greatest of all the prophets, John the Baptist. Malachi is probably written in about 450 B.C. It's now 29 A.D. here. A span of almost 500 years of silence. And it's not by chance that it talks about that John was alone in the desert. And of course, there's a double in John right here. The desert meaning spiritually as well as physically. You know, it's, it's something when silence is shattered. You know, I'm really pleased to have uh, my mom with me here today. My mom is going to be 80 this year. Can you believe it? And uh, my, mom, my mom is here. That's, that's a compliment, actually. My mom is here because my sister's husband had a very terrible stroke, and I appreciate all the prayers that the congregation has offered on up. And, and he is healing, but, but slowly. And my mom has come, leaving my dad all alone down there in Florida, and, and, and literally served night and day to help with Bob's rehabilitation. My mom just has an incredible heart. She's always done that for all of us kids. I mean, mom would take us everywhere all the time. And we were always grateful for it. <laughs> but there was one occasion. This goes back to 1959 when I was five years old. That's right about when the dinosaurs went extinct, you know what I'm talking about right there. And we just moved to Bermuda. My dad was in the Navy, and we got stationed there. And my mom really wasn't too acquainted with going on to a Navy base, because we lived off the base. She wasn't really too acquainted 
with going on to the naval base. And so my brother and I were in the car, just happily minding our own business. And my mom was just taking great care of us, sort of. And there's a little gate, you know, right there. And they got guards, like, with guns. My mom just goes right through the gate, <laughs> waving at the guards. The next thing, silence is shattered. <laughs> the guns are going off like this. My mom stops. The, the guys got their guns drawn. They go, we're going to die. <laughs> Let's just put it this way. The silence was shattered. <laughs> you know, in a very real way, that same sense was the ministry of John the Baptist. It was like firing a gun into a 500-year deafening silence. A desert that the Jews had drifted into spiritually. You know, in many ways, Southern California is not too much different. You know, if you took away all the water, we'd be desert here. And the truth is, though we have a church on almost every corner, it's a spiritual desert of truth. You know, that's why I was just so fired up yesterday for the Women's Day. And all the women that came. You know, we have, we have less than 100 women. We have about 92 sisters in the church. And yesterday, we had about 250 at Women's Day. Is that incredible, guys? I mean, it shows, it shows that people are thirsting in the desert. Are you with me right here? You know, it's, 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 it's been amazing over the last just 15 days. We've seen 12 people baptized and four people restored. You know, when the living water is offered, people are thirsting. They're in a desert. You know, this week, it just came ringing on home. I was talking to a friend, and we were just talking to this person about getting a job, and the person simply said, well, I had, I had to lie on my application. And this other person, and I said, lie on your application? Why would you lie? I just had to, or I couldn't get a job. It's getting testy. And the other person said, well, why did you lie? Because it said, if you've been suicidal or you want to commit suicide that day, you'd be disqualified from the job. It just hits you. Just, it just, people who look like everything is going great, everything is fine, they're in such deep pain. They even consider taking their own lives. But you know, when the living water is offered and you have a heart to go get it nothing's going to stop you you know i'm 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 so fired up about osar getting baptized today uh this young man's quite a young man he goes to ucla and he plays football for ucla amen it was awesome Vic and him just really got into the Bible studies in a super deep way this week. And they studied every day almost. And then after they'd studied about light and darkness and what it really meant to be a Christian and close to God, he had a midterm on Friday. He says, listen, I've got to postpone this midterm. I've got to get right with God. Now, a lot of people would like to postpone their midterm, but he, he did it for a godly reason. And today, he's getting baptized into Christ. Amen, guys? You see, for him, the silence was shattered. Truth was available. Water and life was available. And nothing is going to stop him. Our second point is radical rhetoric. Let's look at this. Verse 7, chapter 3, Luke. John said to the crowds coming out to be baptized by him, You brood of vipers! Who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Now, it's very interesting, the difference in Matthew's account than Luke's account. Let's go check it over just real quickly right here. Matthew chapter 3, verse 7. 
But when John saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to where he was baptizing, he said to them, you brood of vipers! Who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? You see, Matthew's emphasis to the Jewish people was, you need to see what your leaders have done. They've led you astray. Luke's point was, hey, the message that John the Baptist preached was not just for the leaders. You're responsible for your own life. It is kind of interesting. You know, he compared people to snakes. You know, a lot of snakes are poisonous. In other words, you get too close, they're dangerous. They're destructive. You know, it is good to have my mom. It makes me relive a part of my life I forget. <laughs> I remember back in uh, 10th grade, we moved into a new subdivision in Florida. We lived there for a couple of years. And uh, there, there are a lot of snakes there. <laughs> I remember going to one family, came on over the house, said, you've you, you got to send your son Kip on over here. we got a brood of pygmy rattlers right under the front step. And I go, amen, I'll take these babies out. <laughs> but the most memorable one to me was I was coming home from 10th grade, my, my best friend at that time, a guy named Chris LeClaire. And we're coming home, and we had about a mile walk from where the bus let us off. And uh, all of a sudden, crawling into this person's lawn was this huge cottonmouth snake or water moccasin. I mean, it was about this big around. Chris and I go, oh, well, it's maybe gotten a little bit bigger through the years. You know how it is. Sometimes it's good to have your mom in the crowd, and then other times. Anyway, we see this cotton mouse snake. Chris and I go, we got to kill it. So it goes on in the yard, and it kind of hides under this palm shrub. And right next door is a construction thing. And Chris says, okay, Kip, I got an idea. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shove it out with a two-by-four, and then you get it. <laughs> I was a little slow on the uptake on the plan right there. So anyway, he goes on over, and he takes it like this. And all of a sudden, the snake pops out. It's me and the snake. I'm sitting there. I got my two-by-four right here. I take it, and I go, whoa, and I miss. <laughs> You have never seen two guys run so fast. <laughs> well, we went all back. Make a long story short, I got him. Yeah. So anyway, I, I always take it back and I skin them and make them trophies and everything. So I got my books in one hand, talking to Chris, and I'm holding the snake, and it is heavy. It's heavy. All of a sudden, Chris starts hitting me. Like this, not saying he's just pointing. And I look on over, and the snake's head was coming on up to my arm. <laughs> And you know how snakes, when they're dead even, they still want to move and everything? I did not go through that little mental gymnastics right there. I see snake head after my arm. I go, oh, throw it down. There's another stick over here. I just go, boom, 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 boom. I mean, I wanted to make sure he was dead. Did I mention that snakes were poisonous and destructive? That's exactly what Matthew said, John the Baptist said to the religious leaders of that day. It's also what Luke said, John the Baptist said to everybody that got sucked into a hypocritical, pharisaical religion. Sometimes we have the mindset, well, I'm doing okay. I'm just going to let everything be. John the Baptist could not let it be. Poisonous snakes had to be dealt with. And there was only one cure. Let's keep reading. Verse 8. He says, Who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. See, when John preached, a lot of people got defensive and said, Hold it! Are you saying I'm not right with God? I'm a Jew! I'm a child of Abraham! And it looked at their ancestry and in being Jewish as that which saved him. 
You know, a lot of people go, well, I go to this church. It's a really wicked church. That doesn't save you. It's all about your relationship with God. And right here, he says, man, God can raise up more children out of stones. He says, the ax is already at the root. He says, listen, your time is short. You got to deal with your life. What's the only cure? He says, repentance. Otherwise, you will be cut down and thrown in the fire, the fire representing judgment. Well, look what happens. Verse 10. Well, what should we do? The crowd asked. John answered, the man who has two tunics should share with him who has none, and the one who has food should do the same. He says, deal with your selfishness. Deal with your materialism. Tax collectors also came to be baptized. Teacher, they asked, well, what should we do? Don't collect any more than you are required to, he told them. Now, a practice at this particular time was the tax collectors would hire other guys who would do the work for them, and they just kind of lay back. And, of course, if they hired other guys, they had to charge a higher tax to pay for the other people that they weren't really supposed to have employed. Verse 14. Oh, this is a good one. Then some soldiers asked him, and what should we do? He replied, don't extort money and don't accuse people falsely. Be content with your pay. He says, that's what you got to do in order to enter the kingdom of God. Now, you got to have a job. Amen, guys. But how many people today grumble and complain about how much money they make when the real issue is their greed to live at a higher lifestyle than their money allows them to? And John the Baptist says, if you want to get into the kingdom of God, you got to be content with your pay and deal with your life. Verse 15. The people were waiting expectantly. They were all wondering in their hearts if John might possibly be the Christ. John answered them all, I baptize with you with water, but one more powerful than I will come, the thongs of whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear the threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. And with many other words, John exhorted the people and preached the good news to them. But when John rebuked Herod, the Tetrarch, because of Herodias, his brother's wife, and all the other evil things he had done, Herod added this to them all. He locked John up in prison. This radical rhetoric caused him to be locked in prison and eventually to be beheaded. I find it interesting, verse 18. He says, and with many other words, John exhorted the people and preached the good news to them. Gee, what would the bad news have been? <laughs> you see, I, I'm, I'm of a deep conviction that people today are not motivated to repent and to change their lives. Because that's what the word repent means. Literally, in the Greek, means to turn. It's because all they want preached to them is just the good news. I just want to come to church, hear a great music program, shake a few hands, be able to be done in an hour, hour five if it's a long service. <laughs> and, then, and then get on home where I can just chill the rest of the day. And I don't have to see those. I mean, I won't see those people again until a week later. You see, no one is going to appreciate the good news of Jesus Christ, that he died, he was buried, and he was resurrected until they understand the bad news about where their lives are at. I believe a lot of people in this day and age would label John the Baptist harsh, certainly not politically correct. And yet his words were the voice of God. You know, it's interesting. They came to him and said, are you the Christ? He says, no, 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 no. Uh, one more powerful than I will come. As a matter of fact, the thongs of whose sandals I'm not even worthy to untie. You've got to understand that in the mindset of the Jew of that day, even a Jewish slave looked upon the unfastening of sandals as something beneath them. 
For John the Baptist said, listen, I'm not even worthy to untie the sandals. He, he, he says, I'm not even worthy to do something that even Hebrew slaves refuse to do. He says, because he's going to come and baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Matter of fact, his winnowing fork is in his hand to clear the threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn. And the image right here is very, 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 very clear. A winnowing fork is kind of a, a large fork that would be put into the freshly harvested uh, bales of wheat. And they put it in the wheat, and then they toss the, the wheat up in the air. The chaff would separate and blow away, and the wheat kernels would just drop to the ground, ready to be sold. Now, let's think about what that meant. It said the preaching of Jesus, the preaching of John the Baptist would be divisive. It would divide between chaff and wheat. It would divide the hearts of those who really wanted to live for God and those who just mouth it. And of course, a lot of people feel, well, all we need to do is just lock this guy up, put him in jail. And if we get rid of the messenger, we get rid of the message. The problem is, you may silence the messenger, but you'll never silence the voice of God. You may disfellowship the messenger, but you'll never silence the voice of God. The challenge that John lays out here with his radical rhetoric is one that echoes all the way through the Bible. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Come on, Jim. Paul writes in verse 8, Even if I caused you sorrow by my letter, I don't regret it. Though I did regret it, I see that my letter hurt you, but only for a little while. You know I'm happy, not because you were made sorrow, but because your sorrow led you to repentance. For you became sorrowful as God intended, and so were not harmed in any way by us. Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. But worldly sorrow brings death. See what this godly sorrow has produced in you. What earnestness, what eagerness to clear yourselves, what indignation, what alarm, what longing, what concern, what readiness to see justice done. At every point, you have proved yourselves to be innocent in this matter. Right here, Paul references his first letter. And he heard back from them. He says, man, a lot of people were really hurt by you, Paul. He says, well, good. He says, I'm not happy that you're sorrowful. He says, but maybe that sorrowfulness caused you to repent. He says, basically, there are two kinds of sorrow. There's worldly sorrow where you feel bad about what you've done. And there's godly sorrow that says, well, I feel terrible about what I've done, and now I'm going to change it. I'm going to repent. I'm going to become a different person. You know, I had to deal with an issue in my life here. The last several months here in beautiful Southern California, I've put on a few pounds. And I've really been sorry about it. Now, my wife's way of pointing it out is, well, honey, don't you think we should go out and take a walk? <laughs> Translate it, you'd need to drop a few. <laughs> so, I decided to repent this week. I signed up for Gold's Gym. <laughs> now, I didn't sign up for the little light places. I said, you know something, if we're going to deal with this issue, Gold's Gym. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? Of course, the, the, the Lord drove it open even more. I, I, I was in the front row this morning trying to help Elena know when to go up front. My mom goes, honey, your, your, your button's unbuttoned down here. <laughs> Thanks, mom. Thanks. <laughs> really depreciate that. Thank you very much. <laughs> but you know, I mean, it, it, it's awesome. You, you go in there. And my second day, 
I, I saw this guy. I, I don't know whether you know him or not. His name's Lou Ferrigno. And he played the Hulk on TV. You, you know him? And he's the guy that went at it with Arnold Schwarzenegger back in 75, you know, and becoming Mr. Olympia, and then they had the movie Pumping Iron. He walks by me. I'm doing my crunches. I was going to say something, but I said, you know something, I just don't want to embarrass the man. You see, you don't really repent unless you follow the radical rhetoric. You know, I was talking to some of our dear brothers over in the remnant group in Honolulu. And we're excited about sending a mission team over there in June. Amen, church? But one of the brothers over there was sharing. He says, oh, man, we've just been through some really challenging things. I mean, God just works in some tough ways. He says, one of our brothers, uh, Clayton Marquez, he comes off and on. His wife's very faithful, Amaya. But uh, this guy's just been struggling for years. And uh, he's in the construction business, particularly drywall. And he says, over there in Hawaii, the drywall guys that kind of have an after-work fellowship of just going drinking, getting drunk. And just this, this has gone on for years. And his life's just gone more and more downhill. Well, finally, one day, one of the workers at his site that he used to go out with every night jumped off a 30-foot building, 30-story building. 23 years old, killed himself. He goes, oh, I got to do something about this. I, 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 I got to stop drinking. And he kind of white knuckled it for a while. But he didn't really go back to church. Didn't really deal with the core issue. And then one night, he went out with the guys again, got drunk, and then Amaya said, listen, that's it. I'm leaving. He says, give me just one more chance. She says, your only hope is God. He started going back to church, started having daily accountability in his life, getting into Bible study with the brothers, and last week he was restored to Jesus Christ. Is that awesome or not? All of us struggle with sin. Not the same one, but we struggle with it. But are you going to repent not just feel bad about your sin. Try to work on a little. No, no, no. You got to radically repent. You got to do something. Just like our new brother, Clayton, did. Our last point comes from the last part of our text in Luke chapter 3. Yes, the voice of God silence is shattered after 500 years. Yes, John had a radical rhetoric, but right here at the end, we found an arousing acclamation. In verse 21, we read this. When all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. And as he was praying, heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son whom I love, with you I am well Pleased. Can you picture this? All these people are being baptized. All of a sudden, we see Jesus going out to John, and you know the interaction where John was even a bit befuddled. He says, well, shouldn't I be baptized for you? And Jesus says, no, no, to fulfill all righteousness, I need to be baptized. The word baptism means immerse, and so John the Baptist took Jesus and immersed him in the waters of the Jordan River. And when he came up, the Bible says, and this is incredible right here, he begins to pray. He starts talking to God, because this initiates his earthly ministry. He starts talking to God, and then all of a sudden the Bible says, the heavens open, and the Holy Spirit descends on him in the bodily form 
of a dove. Obviously, reminding all who saw it of the dove of hope in the time of Noah. The promise of grace and hope and salvation. But can you imagine it? The heavens open, and then all of a sudden, you're standing there, and you hear, You are my son, <laughs> whom I love. I am well pleased. I mean, you'd be looking at Jesus and go, You know, there's something different about that guy. <laughs> it would be obvious! He is the son of God! Detailing it more here in the Luke's account. It says in verse 23, Now Jesus himself was about 30 years old when he began his ministry. He was the son, so it was thought of Joseph. And then it goes down through, of course, the whole genealogy. And the last two lines read, The son of Adam, the son of God. Now this is interesting. If you contrast this to the genealogy of Joseph, in Matthew, it starts off with Abraham and works down to Joseph. Because, of course, Matthew's point is that Jesus is a Jew from Abraham. Luke's point's quite different. He says, Jesus is the son of Adam, the son of God. And, of course, Jews very often felt free to skip whole generations of people and simply shortcut it and say, even though he might have been somebody's great-great-grandpa, he was the son of. And so very often, you'll read about someone being the son of David, but it's many generations later. And so right here, people understood what this genealogy meant. Jesus was the son of God. That's what it meant. Once more, an arousing affirmation. You know, one of the things that stands out here is the fact that Jesus himself had to undergo an adult water baptism. Isn't it amazing that today people feel so free to do a whole bunch of different things and they don't even look in the Gospels to see, well, what did Jesus do? Jesus was baptized as an adult. Now, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance for forgiveness of sins. And he had no sin, but on the other hand, to fulfill all righteousness, he was baptized. Interestingly enough, we find that to begin the church, this is what was called upon for every single person that would respond to Jesus Christ. Turn to Acts chapter 2. Peter's preaching on the day of Pentecost. He's preaching to thousands of people. This is just 50 days after Jesus was crucified. Of course, Peter's seen the resurrected Christ. Jesus has ascended to heaven. And Peter ends his message, and he says in verse 36, Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you've crucified, both Lord and Christ. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Well, brothers, what shall we do? See, they believed right there. Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, the promises for you and your children, all who are far off, for all of whom the Lord God would call. With many other words, he warned them, and he pleaded with them, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accept this message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. Would that have been an incredible day or not? And look what it says. They devoted themselves, the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and prayer. These people didn't just get baptized. They became disciples. They became disciples. Now, one of the things that's clear here is that in order to come to Jesus Christ, you have to believe that Jesus is the Son of God. But it takes more than just believing. He says, Peter lays out, he says, you have crucified the Christ. Well, how did that happen? He's talking to thousands of people, and he accuses them all of crucifying Jesus. 
They couldn't have all just nailed the nails in Jesus' hands. That's not what he means. They weren't all there yet, because this is the, the Feast of the Pentecost. They weren't all there when Pilate gave the choice between Barabbas and Jesus. And the people said, give us Barabbas. What do I do with Jesus? Crucify him. They weren't even there, so that's not what he means. There's only one thing it possibly can mean. Romans 3.23 says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Therefore, everybody, no matter how good, needs to be forgiven of their sin to have a relationship with God. And these people understood. It says, our sins have crucified Jesus, and they're cut to the heart. And they said, what do we do? Kind of just like back with John the Baptist. Peter says, repent. Turn away from the darkness. Turn to the light as a disciple. And then be baptized. Be immersed for two reasons. One, the forgiveness of sins to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And the Bible says those who accept this message were baptized. And they were devoted. Are you with me right here? And you know what's interesting is that we find that a lot of people today, and I understand this, they say, well, you know something? I was baptized before. I was baptized before. You know, my, my background is, is that uh, I, I really got religious, so to speak, at the end of my 10th grade year in high school. I started going to church and dragging my family there. <laughs> and, uh, I mean, I, I really got fired up. I'd never really gotten into the Bible and read it. I thought this was incredible. And then that summer they had kind of a, a, a rousing kind of a, a revival at the local church I was going to. And they asked for people to come forward that wanted to accept Christ. And I, I came forward, and I was taken in the back with some college students, and, and they said, here, this is what you got to do. You just need to say a prayer, and Jesus will come into your life, and you'll be saved. I believed it. I was very sincere, and I did that very sincerely. And I really worked on changing my life. There were changes. Well, I thought I was saved. I thought I was good to go. A couple of years later, I get to college. By this time, my life is going downhill. Of course, sometimes the Lord has to let you go downhill. You know what I'm talking about right here? <laughs> to get the wake-up call, that shattering silence. And I got invited out to this church at this really fired-up college group. I said, oh, man, I'm going to join. This is great. This is, this is what I've been looking for. These people are so loving. They're so dedicated. I'm, I'm going to join this church. And I, and I talked to, to the people there, and they said, well... Kip, you need to understand what the Bible says about how to have a right relationship with God. I said, okay, let's see what the Bible says. <laughs> I remember, I was sitting on the back pew. We were in a little tiny church building, sitting in the back pew, and they laid out this scripture right here. And I go, are you telling me that you got to repent and then get baptized in order to be saved? Are you saying I'm lost? Yeah. Okay, I was checking. Um, I said, well, here's the thing. You know, here's what I did. I, I, I was saved, and then about six weeks later, I went to this class at my church, and then I was baptized. It was sprinkling, but they called it baptism. Well, baptism means to immerse. And then they shared another scripture. It's another scripture written by Luke. Turn to Acts chapter 19. Here in chapter 19, we find the ministry of Paul. And, of course, we're all familiar with the fact that Luke writes both Luke and the book of Acts. One follows another. And so Luke records this in chapter 19. While Paul was at Corinth, Paul took the road to the interior and arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples and asked them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They answered, No, we've not even heard there is a Holy Spirit. So Paul asked, Well, then what baptism did you receive? John's baptism, they replied. Paul said, Ah, oh. John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. I go, Whoa. They got rebaptized. Yeah, because you see, there's only one baptism. My first one didn't count. It wasn't a real baptism. It wasn't what the Bible commanded. 
And you see, when I saw these scriptures, I, at first I was, well, I was ticked off. <laughs> I, I was defensive. Because I started thinking in my mind, everybody that believed like me at that point. Not only were they saying I was lost, going, well, you're saying he's lost, she's lost, he's lost, they're lost. And when you do that and you give in to sentimentality, that's, that's when you just go downhill. You see, if, if you really love God, you got to figure out what is right. Then you figure out who is right. Are you with me right here, guys? Otherwise, sentimentality will deceive you and cloud you from really seeing what the truth is. And you know, when I started thinking about it, I knew my, I, my life wasn't really a disciple. I was religious. I mean, I even led a Bible study as a freshman in college. But my life was tanking. And after I started thinking about it, I go, you know something? If they're right then that means I've never been a Christian. I've always been in the dark. And that way, when I repent and get baptized, then I'm coming into the light. So that means all the sins I've done would be forgiven and I would start again. I go, that's good news. I could have a new life. As the passage about Paul says, and all your sins will be washed away. You know, we live in a time when people want to have their own theology. They want to go to a comfortable church. And they really aren't interested in hearing the voice of God. And in effect, these people can deceive themselves and remain in a spiritual desert all the days of their lives. But for some, if they dare get into the Word of God, it's like someone is firing a gun in the air. It shatters that silence. And you start reading it, and let me tell you something, it can be super challenging super convicting. But if you dare allow your heart to be aroused, then you, like the early Christians and those who still hear the voice of God today, at the waters of baptism, you ask two questions. Do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God who died and was buried and on the third day rose again. And you say yes. And the question then comes, what is your good confession? Jesus is Lord. May God bless us all as we serve the Lord this week.